Hi, welcome back to the Wandering Wesleyan and our Walking in the Word series. I am Chaplain Greg Johnston, and uh, it's so good to see you. And uh, even though I'm not seeing you in real life, I'm glad that you're here and watching. Um, we are going through the Walking in the Word series, and last week we finished going through Genesis 1 through 3. And uh, now we're going to take off a little bit and uh, we're going to go a little bit more high level and we're going to pick up a little bit more speed and we're going to start looking at the Torah. And so you may ask, what is the Torah? I've mentioned that word a bunch of different times and I want to uh, sort of get into why we call the first four books of the Bible, first five books of the Bible, the Torah. Uh, our Jewish friends have their Bible divided a little bit differently than we do. So you might have in your Bible the first five books listed as the Pentateuch, and that is the Greek word for five books, the Pentateuch. Our Jewish friends have their first five books labeled the Torah, which means it's, it's, trans, it's translated more often as law, although it's much more than law. It's more teachings, the teachings, and these are the teachings of Moses. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, even though there are a lot of rules and regulations, especially in Leviticus, um, it's, both, it's mostly teaching about the fundamentals of what it means to be a Jewish believer. And the stories that come out, because there's a lot of narrative and a lot of stories are meant to teach the Jewish person and the Christian person what it is like to be a child of God. So, Torah, teaching, first five books. The, the second part of the Jewish Bible is called the Nevi'im, or the prophets. Now, we have a lot of what our Jewish friends consider prophetic books in history. So Joshua through Kings, to our Jewish friends, would be uh, prophetic, would be part of the prophets. Uh, Ruth wouldn't be a part of that. Ruth would be a part of the next section, which we'll talk about. So Joshua, Samuel, Kings, and then all of the prophets that we think of normally as prophets, except for Daniel. Daniel is in the next section. And that next section is called the Ketuvim, or the Writings. So Psalms, Proverbs, all Ecclesiastes, all of those writings, uh, Esther, Chronicles, uh, Nehemiah, Ezra, all of those are in the Ketuvim. And they use an acrostic to refer to their entirety of scriptures, and that's Tanakh. Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim, Tanakh. So when we look at the first five books of the Bible, just know that our Jewish friends uh, don't have the same arrangement that we do. And uh, uh, if you want to get a good look of, of what this looks like, there's a Bible called the Complete Jewish Study Bible, or even the Tree of Life Bible has it in this order. And if you have the Version Bible app, you can get those versions real easy and you can take a look. And uh, the Complete Jewish Study Bible puts all the books in their Hebrew names. So that's kind of interesting too. But we're talking about the Torah and with the Torah, we start with Genesis. Now we've focused quite a bit on the first, uh, the first three chapters of Genesis. And when we say the word Genesis, that doesn't sound Hebrew, does it? It sounds Greek and Genesis is Greek. Um, what the Greek names, Genesis, Exodus, that is not a Hebrew name. Deuteronomy certainly isn't a, a, a Hebrew name. Where does that come from? Well, it comes from a, a, a writing called the Septuagint. And this is a translation of the Hebrew Bible that happened a couple of hundred years before Jesus. And the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek which was the common language of the world at that point. Um, Seventy scholars in Alexandria, Egypt, did this translation. And when they did so, they reordered the books 
of the Old Testament. So the Jewish Bible is, as we said, Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim, the Tanakh. The Septuagint put it in the order that we're kind of used to today. And they give, they gave the, bio, the, the, the Bible books Greek names. Psalms is actually Breshit. Um, I'm sorry, that's Genesis. Genesis is actually Breshit. Psalms are Tehillim. So all of these, and we'll get into this as we get into those different books. All of these books were given Greek names, Genesis, Psalms. And there were also some intertestamental books between the ending of what we would consider uh, the Hebrew Bible, which would be Malachi and our version of the Bible, uh, Second Chronicles and our Hebrew friends. Um, after that, there were many books written, obviously. People keep writing books. So like First and Second Maccabees and Tobit and Judith and Wisdom and First Enoch, all of these books were floating around in between when the Hebrews said the scriptures ended and when the New Testament began to be uh, began to be written. Now, for the most part, Christians accepted the Septuagint and the Old Testament up to the Reformation. So if you are a Roman Catholic and you look in your Bible and then you look at your Protestant friend's Bible, you'll notice that there's a bunch of books missing. And there are, that's called the Apocrypha or those intertestamental books like Maccabees, Tobit, Judith, and Wisdom. Um, the only, uh, just as a, this is free, you don't have to pay extra for this. The only uh, organization, Christ-following organization or church that accepts First Enoch is the Ethiopian church. And if you remember your story in Acts, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch who was saved by Philip went back to Ethiopia and established the Ethiopian church, which is still around today. And they thought First Enoch was scripture. So First Enoch, important books. All of these are important books because they tell the Jewish story. And uh, for my Protestant brothers and sisters and my Catholic brothers and sisters, please don't divide over this. It's not worth it because these are all important books. Roman Catholics consider it scripture. I'm a Protestant. I don't believe it's scripture. I don't believe it's in the canon. I do believe they're super important books that every Protestant should read regardless. Okay? It makes sense? All right. Let's go. So, the Protestant order of the Hebrew scriptures is the Torah, history, wisdom, prophets. We talked about that last week, starting with the Torah. First five books, Moses probably wrote the Torah but he also had help. Um, and you, we noticed that in the beginning of Genesis, with Gen the difference between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, the writing's very, very different. And this means that there were, he probably had people helping him put this together, or it started as an oral tradition and then was later put down as a writing. Um, here's, the, here's the thing. With these books, they went through several revisions. So the Torah was around when Samuel was around and his school did some editing work on it. And then when the exile happened and the nation of Israel was exiled to Babylon, even further revisions were done to it. So that by the end of the exile, they came out with what we really have today. And it, it's amazing that God has sustained these scriptures for all of that time. So, Breshit. This is Genesis. Breshit. It's divided into two sections. So, the first section of Genesis, and we're going through the Torah now, starting with Breshit, or Genesis. And it's divided into two sections. Chapters 1 through 11 have to do with God in the world. Whereas chapters 12 through 50 focus on a single family. Now family is going to be very important. We'll get to that. But first of all, the first 11 chapters. Now we've been through the first three, um, but we pick up in chapter four and we are talking about Adam and Eve's kids. Post fall, they've been tossed out of the garden and now they are 
making their way in this very scary world that is now full of death and sin. And they have two sons, Cain and Abel. And I would imagine most of you have heard that story that Cain killed Abel. Um, why would God reject Cain's offering but accept Abel's offering? When you read the text, you'll see that both of them had different occupations. So Cain was a shepherd. He herded animals. Abel was a farmer and he raised crops. Abel gave the first and best offering to God because he knew that everything he had was provided from the Lord. Cain just gave. Cain gave out of obligation, not out of a sense of gratitude. So God said, I don't accept your offering. Now, what Cain could have done is he could have gone back and said, all right, let's do it again. I'm going to give you my best. I am grateful for the fact that I can sustain my life raising animals. He didn't do that. He became jealous of his brother. And the first murder in the Bible happens when he kills his brother. God gives a curse upon Cain. So Cain is doubly cursed. He's got the curse from his parents and now the curse from the sin. And this curse that God gives him says that he needs to wander about. He's going to keep wandering through the world. And this scares Cain. And he says that... Right here in Genesis 13, my punishment is too great to bear since you are banishing me today from the face of the earth and I must hide from your presence and become a restless wanderer on the earth. Whoever finds me with kill, will kill me. Now, like his parents, God provides an answer for that. Look at uh, verse 15. The Lord replied to him, in that case, whoever kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. And he placed a mark on Cain so whoever found him would not kill him. Now, why is this important? Because one of Cain's descendants, his name is Lamech. Lamech comes around in verse 23 of chapter 4. All right. It says, Lamech said to his wives. Now he had two wives. This is the first instance of polygamy. Look, folks, some people say that the Bible justifies all kinds of things. Polygamy, slavery, all of this kind of stuff. In the case of polygamy, there's a lot of it in the Bible. A lot. There's going to be a lot in Genesis. But here's the thing. When you read the accounts of people who practiced polygamy, it never turns out good. It's always disastrous. So this fellow named Lemech, he says to his two wives, Ada and Scylla, that's his wives, hear my voice. Wives of Lemech, pay attention to my words. For I killed a man wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain is to be avenged seven times over, then for Lemech, it will be 77 times over. So he is taking that protection that God gave him and using it as a weapon against other people. Lamech was a bad dude. He was a bad guy. But notice that language. Where have you heard that before? If Cain is to be avenged seven times over, Jesus, how many times should we forgive? Seven times? Then for Lamech, it will be 77 times. Jesus replied, no. You are to forgive 70 times seven. So he's pointing to this, where Lamech says that judgment and vengeance should be repaid 77 times over. Jesus flips that and says, no, forgiveness is to be repaid 70 times seven over. Just a little link there. And that's one of the cool things about reading the Bible. Really cool things about reading the Bible is that there's hyperlinks 
back and forth in between the Old Testament and the New Testament, between the Hebrew scriptures and the, and the gospels and the epistles, there's these hyperlinks back and forth. And as you're reading through, you'll see that. Now, the next section of Genesis, uh, chapters 6 through 10, is a big section, and it's kind of controversial. It's the story of Noah. Why is it controversial? Well, there's been lots of people who say, this could have never happened. And for those of us, I say, okay, but what is the story telling you? I tend to think it happens. I think there's an awful lot of uh, stories of floods throughout the ancient world that sort of match this. Um, there's geographical evidence that a, a, that a tremendous flood happened at some time in the ancient world. Um, no one in a big ark building that seems impossible for one man to do. Well, okay. But if God enables him to do it, he's an amazing God. He can do anything. But if that's beyond something you can believe, fine. Hold on to that. Because that's not the point of the story, whether or not there was an actual ark, whether or not there was an actual flood. If you can put that aside and understand what God is trying to tell us through this narrative. So, we're going to go to chapter 6. And we're going to talk about Noah. Now, Noah, now Cain has his line of people. And his line of people are pretty evil. Adam and Eve had another son. His name is Seth. And Noah is a descendant of Seth. So it goes Adam, Seth, Noah. We're going to come back. We're going to review that lineage over and over again. And in verse 11 of chapter 6, it talks about how the earth is corrupted. How the earth is completely filled with sin. And there's only one righteous dude, Noah. People get a little miffed, and you know what? We should be uncomfortable with the fact that God pronounces judgment over the whole earth and wants to start over again. Because in our minds, how many innocent people die? Well, here's the key. There were no innocent people. Even the children brought into this would have been raised in this evil. Humanity was on its way to destroying itself through violence, through killing, through child sacrifice, through all of this. And God was just disgusted with the way humanity was acting. But there was Noah. God cleanses the creation with the act of the flood. It's a cleansing. It's a baptism. Think of it that way where Noah is placed in the water and rises up out of the water. The ark holds the remnant of humanity and creation. And when it's all over, there's a rainbow in the sky as a sign of God's promise that he will never flood the earth again. He's reserving fire and brimstone and hail, but that is for the end of this series when we get to uh, the book of Revelation, John's Apocalypse. So, the flood ends. Earth is cleaned. And we can start over again with a brand new family. And Noah has a son. And he has three sons, actually. Okay? So his three sons, uh, Shem and Ham, are the two main ones here. And Ham does something really nasty. So Noah gets out of the ark, he settles down, and he plants a vineyard. And when you plant a vineyard, you tend to want to make wine. You make wine. Noah got drunk, very drunk. And it, the Bible says that he was exposed to be naked. And this is in uh, Genesis 9. So let's go there real quick. 
I got my... Uh, Noah, as a man of the soil, began planting a vineyard. He drank some of the wine, became drunk, and uncovered himself in the tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father naked and told his two brothers outside. All right. Now, to us moderns, we think, saw him naked? What, what's the big deal? Well, look up Leviticus 18. Uh, verses 7 through 8. I'm not going to read it here. It's gross. It uses the same language. It's a. It's actually a sexual immorality against Noah's wife. Nasty. And then Ham goes out and he brags about it to his brothers. While Shem, in verse 23, then Shem and Japheth, um, Noah's other son took a cloak and placed it over their shoulders and walking backward, they covered their father's nakedness. Their faces were turned away and they did not see their father naked. And when Noah awoke from his drinking and learned that his youngest son had what he had done to him. And again, remember that is, um, that is Ham. He said, Canaan, who's Canaan? Canaan is Ham's son. Canaan is cursed. He will be the lowest of lowest of slaves to his brothers. So, son of Ham is named Canaan, and they settle in a region called Canaan. And the people who grew up there were called what? Canaanites. They're going to come back later. So that's the story of, of Noah, and I'm going to end here, and we're going to finish up this first section of chapters 1 through 11 with a brief discussion of the Tower of Babel, and then start talking about that individual family. So if you like these videos, please like and subscribe, and uh, I will see you next week. This is Chaplain Greg. God bless.